Okay, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today um, for our presentation on the power of mentorship, bridging theory and practice in eating disorder recovery. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. My name is Kevin Dunn, and I'm the Director of Family Mentorship here at Equip. Today, I'll be pre uh, introducing our presenters, Lainey Clark, J.D. Olet, and Maris Degener. But first, I want to acknowledge Equip Academy, the program that we will be providing free CE and CME credits to all eligible clinicians attending this live webinar today. Created by Equip, a virtual evidence-based treatment program serving patients of all ages, diagnoses, and backgrounds across the US, Equip Academy was developed with one clear mission, to educate the clinical community on eating disorders for free. This year alone, it's estimated that 5.5 million Americans will get an eating disorder, only 23% of them will get treatment, and an even smaller fraction will get treatment that works. By uncovering research, insights from treating different populations, education on lesser known signs and symptoms, and recommendations on guiding patients to treatment, our goal is to provide you and your colleagues with tools and knowledge to ultimately help your patients get access to treatment that works. Before we dive in, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today. Lainey Clark is a licensed professional counselor and therapy lead at Equip. Lainey brings expertise in family-based treatment, emotion-focused family therapy, enhanced cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders, adolescent-focused therapy, and dialectical behavior therapy as well as past experience working across levels of care, including IOP, PHP, and outpatient mental health treatment centers. Lainey received her Master of Counseling degree at Dallas Baptist University. J.D. Olette is Equip's Director of Lived Experience, formerly Director of Mentorship, and an educator who came to this work after the youngest of her four children developed anorexia nervosa in 2012. Grateful that her family benefited from early aggressive intervention with evidence-based care, she later channeled her skill sets into the eating disorder field. JD is passionate about ensuring that all families have access to the same psychoeducation, skills, coaching, and support that made the difference for her family and enabled her daughter to achieve long-term recovery. Maris Degener is Equip's Director of Peer Mentorship. After recovering from anorexia nervosa as a teenager, Maris has harnessed her lived experience to support others suffering from eating disorders and leads the training and development of peer mentors at Equip. Her story was featured in the documentary, I Am Maris, formerly available on Netflix, to spread hopefulness around recovery and destigmatize talking openly about mental health challenges. Maris studied psychology at UC Santa Cruz. A few quick housekeeping items about this webinar. Attendance for the full 60 minutes is required in order to be eligible for CE or CME credits. And our presenters may take brief pauses throughout the presentation to address questions, but there will be more time allotted for Q&A at the end. So please utilize Zoom's Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. And wanna thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy today's event. So with that, I will now hand off to Maris Degener. So much, Kevin. I probably should have advanced this slide before, but thank you for the really gracious introductions. Thanks for being here. To get us going, wanted to review our objectives for our time together today. Our first objective is that you are able to describe the current research on mentorship and peer support as an evidence-informed practice. We also hope that you will be able to name two to three specific ways that mentorship and peer support can be incorporated in eating disorder treatment 
And then finally, we hope that you'll be able to identify specific examples of how mentorship can support eating disorder recovery. And with that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Lainey, to tell us a little bit more about why mentor support matters. Yay, thank you, Maris. I'm so excited to jump into this topic with you all. So uh, we'll start by looking at a little bit of background. So one thing we know for sure um, is that people with lived experience and mental health have been influencing how we care for patients for centuries. It's actually not quite new. And you know this because you have been involved in peer support. I am probably 100% sure um, you've reached out to a friend when you needed support, you've gone to a neighbor, um, we've seen, we see the effectiveness of peer support um, in, in childbirth. Um, it's more and more popular for those in recovery from alcohol. So um, it's, it's, it's been around, it's intuitive in how we work as people, how we communicate and how we heal as people to do it in community. Um, but a couple formal landmarks that we want to point out um, are in the 1960s, the campaign for improved and more humane psych health care grew alongside the civil rights and women's, women's rights movements. Um, in particular, right, peer, the, the influence of lived experience and peer support evolved mental health treatment over time. Um, we have... We have knowledge. <laughs> I think things that I maybe try to forget about how psych care used to be really inhumane and, and lacked compassion, lacked respect. And so um, thankful this is not the case anymore. So we move forward into the 1990s and see how peer support begins to emerge as a more formal and integrated role of the mental health community. And now mid to late 2000s, um, the field of substance use, like I said, it's now a bit pro proliferated with this and, and sponsorship and seeing people who have uh, years of recovery gone through the treatment themselves are acting as a role of support to provide hope, um, guidance for those who are currently in a treatment program. All right, so a couple evidence-based, um, a couple things we can see from evidence and research is, um, in a wide sense, um, peer support improves physical, emotional, psychological health, it promotes self-management across a, di a diversity of diseases and population groups. Um, notably, a recent systemic review showed that 83% of the studies reported significant benefits um, of the peer support. It promoted behavior change. It supported their chronic disease management. Um, and so definitely something to highlight. 83% is a lot. And then a couple other examples of peer, su peer support, family support in action, right? This isn't just in, this isn't, isn't just adequate. It isn't just in the mental health community. We see this with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. They have a program called the Power of Two for folks who are fighting inflammatory bowel disease. And the American Diabetes Association, they have a program called, um, uh, utilizes care and education specialists. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, their Peer Connect program connects both patients and family members to support. And then NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, uses peer-to-peer -peer and family-to-family -family support also. Um, this is my slide too. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> One last thing, when we think about the inclusion of peer supports and research, what a highlight. Again, just generally, it, have, it helps improve effectiveness in people engaging in care. It instills hope and self-confidence, decreases substance use, increases self-care and quality of life. I mean, any those right there just sound amazing. Like, wrap it up and I'll take it home. Um, but especially in the ED community, we look for we look for anything that can help patients feel more hopeful, feel more confident, help families. Um, it decreases rehospitalization rates, reduces the length of, length of stay, improves cost effectiveness, always a good thing. Um, it helps parents collaborate with other professionals, um, uh, kind of builds that bridge. Like right? when someone has been there, they can give guidance and tips and recommendations. Um, decreases internalized blame, decreases isolation, also just notable in, in the history of mental health in particular, where families received a lot of blame for their loved one's struggles. And so to be able to um, decrease that blame, um, instill hope, feel less alone, increase confidence um, is, a, is a wonderful role in this in this field. And now I think I'm passing it on to Maris. 
Thank you. I'll unmute myself. Mm -hmm. um, to say a little bit more specifically in the realm of eating disorders, we wanted to highlight some areas where we've seen peer support be very successful. Um, so we've seen that peer support is a really integral component to effective eating disorder prevention programs, um, such as the Everybody Project or the Body Project. And these programs don't just rely on cognitive dissonance as a core part of the intervention. It also relies on being in community with others who are effectively navigating similar challenges. We've also seen in eating disorders that the use of peers can lead to significantly lower dropout rates from treatment. Um, I'm sure it's a, not a surprise to many folks in the audience that recovering from an eating disorder is incredibly hard work. It is not uncommon to see folks uh, pull back from treatment or step away from care for a multitude of reasons. And so the fact that we're seeing peer support help folks stay more connected to and integrated into treatment is a huge deal. Um, you may sometimes hear us use the phrase, patients don't fail treatment, treatment fails patients. And the core of that idea is really that patients aren't doing something wrong. They're not failing recovery. We're simply seeing that there's areas where more support could be beneficial in helping patients see the full course of treatment towards recovery from an eating disorder. We've also seen larger decreases in depression, body dissatisfaction, and also um, other behaviors like binge eating days in a week or restrictive days in a week. And we wanted to underscore at the bottom here that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services now actually recognize peer support as an evidence-based practice. Of course, the asterisk here, which I know my colleague JD will talk about in a little bit, is that this is within the context of proper training, support, and supervision, which we know only elevates this work further. But what actually uh, is a peer mentor? <laughs> it can be helpful to spend some time with this definition. Uh, in short, you may hear us say that peer mentors are people who identify as being in a solid space of recovery from an eating disorder. Um, you may sometimes hear us say family mentor, um, which JD will speak more about. This is often defined as someone who supported a loved one, commonly a child, through the process of recovery. And we know that peer mentorship can help lead to improvements in body dissatisfaction, mood, and eating disorder behaviors, especially when compared to either having um, other types of social support, which may not come with the benefits of training and practice and supervision, um, or compared to having no support at all, which is unfortunately quite common for folks who may be experiencing guilt or shame regarding their diagnosis and may just not know who to turn to for those avenues of support. And we've also seen that peer mentorship can help improve quality of life and help eating disorder patients attend appointments with other treatment providers. I really wanna put a pin in this point um, because so much of our presentation isn't about uh, you know, pitting peer mentorship against other forms of, of care that's provided. It's about how peer mentorship can help deepen those connections to other providers and make it feel more accessible, more welcoming to turn to someone like a therapist or like a medical provider to get all those different angles that we know are essential for wraparound care. And with that, um, I'll turn it to JD to say a little bit more about family peer-to-peer -peer support. Thank you. Um, Lainey did a great job laying the foundation on some of the things we know about peer-to-peer -peer support. I'm gonna dive into a little more specifically, um, what do we know about this in the family context? So um, family peer-to-peer -peer support, fundamental element of uh, the children's mental health movement. And that's been longstanding. I think this is really important. And to highlight something Lainey mentioned already, there's a strong, strong history of family blame in the eating disorder field in particular. So really we're kind of swimming against that tide and really understanding that not having all these things embedded has really been to the detriment of eating disorder recovery. So, um, Kimberly Hogwood of Columbia um, talks about four core outcomes and also acknowledges that we haven't done enough research in this area. I would say that um, what she says here really um, is in line with the things that we observe as we practice. So decreased isolation, decreased internalized blame, uh, increased realization of the importance of self-care for parents. Um, that's something I actually spend a lot of time talking to parents about and also redefining self-care away from the Manny petty paradigm, uh, which makes it a lot more accessible for people. And increased ability to take action. So when we gain knowledge and when we know what the purpose is and when we know the skills we need to employ, it's going to be a lot easier to take the action um, that is um, 
prescribed and recommended by the other providers on the team. So we also have this in adult mental health as well. Um, and NAMI is a wonderful, wonderful example of this. So um, back in 2010, looking at some of these models, um, we found that client outcomes were largely positive. And I love this sentence, it may be that providing support to the entire family, mobilized and strengthened the family unit, resulted in enhanced client outcomes in these critical domains. And would really co-sign that. One of the things that we really talk to families about almost immediately is the fact that um, families can come out of this journey, this experience much stronger than before um, because of all these enhancements. So um, the wonderful NAMI family to family education program I did a study that shows that this is effective for enhancing coping and empowerment of families of persons with mental illness, though not for reducing their subjective burden and other benefits or problem solving, reducing distress, all of those sorts of things. Um, and we hope to have a lot more research around this in the years to come. So basic foundations of um, family peer support that were laid out by SAMHSA um, is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer support is grounded in lived experience. Um, and that is really at the core of it, um, is this idea that if you've lived through something, you have very specific knowledge that you can't get any other way. Um, so this idea of being able to bridge theory and practice and provide that support. Um, so we are talking with this about anyone who has a permanent relationship with a child um, and is seeking help. And when we say child, um, that's really a loved one of any age. Um, I happen to have four adult children and they are always be my children regardless of how old they are and they're getting pretty old now. Um, also a lot of help in experiencing navigating complex behavioral health systems. It's hard enough to navigate as a provider, right? So navigating that as a family member is very, very difficult to do. And some amazing resources are coming out around that. I wanna highlight Susanna Fox, if you're familiar with her work, doing a lot of work around peer-to-peer -peer playbooks and really, really good stuff. Um, this lived experience connection um, and support really communicates active ex acceptance. Um, and we know that all people have biases. And so one of the things you have to do as you come into this peer support space is really recognize and manage your own biases, um, which is a really important thing for us to do in all our work. Um, and then a concept that we call meeting families where they are. So you have to be committed to working on a starting place of welcoming everyone in, no judgment, no shame, all of those sort of DBT foundations that go into this as well. Um, and really thinking of it less as sort of like, just sit here and let me just sort of like dump my knowledge all over you and more finding out where you are, what are the tools you will need to move forward. Um, really important to base this on strategic self-disclosure. And uh, Lainey's going to talk a little bit about this in the therapy realm. It's a very, very hot topic and really important to really think about the ways in which it's important for you to be vulnerable and the parts of your story that are appropriate to share and the purpose of sharing the story. Um, when you are a family peer supporter, um, it's not about sort of your own next stage of healing or things in your own journey. You really have to keep the focus where it needs to be on the family you're supporting. Um, and then through that self-disclosure, right, this really skillful self-disclosure, that's how we build connections and partnerships. It's really hard to feel connected and trust someone if they haven't also been vulnerable with you. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to highlight. And this thing, we're partnering with people rather than delivering to. So again, it's not the brain dump of all the things I've learned. It's helping you also um, come alongside, learn those things for yourself, learn them in the context of your own life and your own journey. Um, and it's support for support's sake rather than delivering the service of a therapist, a dietitian, a medical provider. So it's this full partnership that really enhances uh, overall treatment goals. So in eating disorders, what does that look like right now? So first of all, huge emerging area of interest and in study. Um, Project HEAL did a collaboration where they've um, found some things. Feast as well, always wanna learn more. Um, we are very uh, data-driven and research oriented. So we'll add to the knowledge in this field. Um, historically and informally in the eating disorder field, families have been supporting each other for a very long time 
through an organization called FEAST, Families Empowered and Supporting Treatment of Eating Disorders. And it's not just families, it's people in recovery themselves, and it's a lot of amazing clinicians as well. And the focus is on that family support and how do we execute the family support. Um, for some people around the world, the FEAST uh, website and the FEAST forum may be the only access that people have to evidence-based information, up-to-date psychoeducation. So some, some families have to rely on peer support, family support solely. Um, so luckily, many, many um, clinicians partner with FEAST um, in order to be able to provide these resources in psychoeducation, and they're very, very, very powerful. Um, and then we've started having these formal programs come up. Obviously, the work we do at Equip that we're very, very proud of. Um, and then um, this is something in Australia that they are really, really leaning into. So um, there are um, care consultation services and there are career coaching programs there. And one interesting note, um, during the pandemic, that really gave the folks at uh, the care consultants at the Victoria Center for Excellence in Eating Disorders the chance to really look at this um, pretty specifically in that um, waiting lists became so long that what they decided to do is offer this service to people while they were on the waiting list. And they found it was really impactful. And in, in fact, when people's sort of number finally came up to access the service, very often, most or all of the weight restoration had been done. And so the clinicians were in, able then to dive into that work that specifically they do. So what does it look like at Equip? Um, first of all, and Maris alluded to this, it's a lot of training and it's a lot of supervision. Um, it's anywhere between 80 and 100 hours. Um, we also do a lot of um, weekly uh, continuing education as an entire provider team that's very helpful. Um, some of the very specific things that family mentors receive a lot of training on um, and peer mentors in general is scope of practice. So defining everyone's lane and what they're contributing to, which piece of the puzzle are they and how can we all work together to make sure things work. And then a lot of things around this strategic disclosure. Um, supervision and consultation, um, very robust. Don't have to tell you know all of you how important that is. And it's sort of an interesting note that I realized as um, people came into this work from other fields, the word supervision is a lot scarier if you haven't worked in mental health because it usually means someone's out to get you. So uh, we sort of reorient people to this really wonderful idea of supervision and consultation. And we provide that in group and individual settings. And then at Equip, because we do uh, treat patients from all ages, we really have to figure out what is the support we're offering. It's gonna vary by treatment model. It's gonna be different for CBTE and different for FBT. It's gonna look different if someone is 12 or 24 or 60, um, if it's for their child, if it's for their partner, if it's for a colleague. So all of these things go into this. So, um, Depending on what level we are at, we can really, um, particularly in the FBT model and FBT for uh, transitional age youth or FBT Tay, huge fan of that, um, involves a lot of robust information sharing with families. So a lot of back and forth and a lot of input from family members on that journey. Um, for our folks that are over 18 and they're using non-FBT models, we're going to nuance that disclosure a lot. It's going to be based on what are legal abilities, what um, permissions has the patient given, all sorts of things. And so figuring out how do we provide the best support to the family to support their loved one in the context of the disclosures and the information sharing we are allowed to make. So those are some of the ways we really stay on top of our um, peer support teams at Equip. All right, back to Maris. Thanks, JD. Um, very much in the spirit of the overarching theme of this presentation, we wanted to pair both the latest research with also our perspectives, our lived experience um, as different folks in the field. Uh, so I wanted to share with you all a little bit more about my own recovery. Uh, I first saw the onset of symptoms when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, my parents started observing changes in my eating and my exercise habits, but they really were just at a loss for what they were seeing or what to do about it. Uh, my parents will often say they really had more of a, a pop culture understanding of eating disorders. They kind of knew the stories they heard from a friend of a friend or that they saw in a magazine or in a movie. But when it came to seeing an eating disorder in their own child, they were mostly just terrified. <laughs> they knew something was wrong. They didn't know exactly what to do about it. 
Um, at first they brought me to therapy, but my symptoms worsened to the point where I needed to be hospitalized. And that's where my parents first got their very um, in-depth uh, psychoeducation on what an eating disorder is and how to support your child with one. Something to really highlight here is that I very much did not want to recover at this point. Um, I either thought there wasn't really a problem or if there was a problem, I didn't want to do anything about it. And my parents got what at the time felt like very topsy-turvy advice that they needed to help me move towards recovery before I felt ready to do it all independently. What that looked like for us was my parents were tasked with my weight restoration, with plating my meals, supervising my meals, decreasing my movement and exercise, which was incredibly difficult for the full family. Things did start to get better, although there were many ups and downs throughout that process. But overall, I felt very lonely throughout the whole thing. I didn't know other people in my life who were open about having experienced an eating disorder. I also found myself looking for some proof. I was like, this is so hard. Is it going to be worth it in the end? Is it actually possible for things to get better? And I was actually feeling pretty hopeless for the majority of this process. So many of the stories that I did have access to, if I found them online or in media, usually ended with not a lot of hope. Kind of this idea that things might get a little bit better, but they will always be hard. Maybe it's not even worth it to put the effort into recovery. As time went on though, I started talking a little bit more openly about my story. And I was really surprised by how many people had experienced eating disorders or other mental health challenges. And it really struck me that it, it felt like we were all kind of suffering in silence side by side. And I really started craving more stories of the hopefulness that can come with these experiences. That yes, it is incredibly difficult. And there are countless stories out there about how much is possible when you do have access to care, support, resources, and community. So that really drew me, of course, to the role of the peer mentor that I wanted to tell you a little bit more about. Um, here on the screen, you'll see some words that come to mind when I think about what makes peer mentors so effective. I want to highlight skillfulness, as JD mentioned, and we're going to keep putting a pin in it because it's such an important part of this practice. Our peer mentors get trained and have a ton of support in what I often think of as two main buckets of skills. Uh, time and time again, when we talk to folks who've benefited from peer support, we hear two main themes, listening and sharing, being able to really actively listen to be a space where a patient or an individual in treatment can vent, share their perspective, share their ideas about their recovery. Um, and then also to have someone who is really trained and skillful in how to make self-disclosures in a way that really centers the patient and centers their needs. I also think of collaboration. As JD mentioned, within the, the confines of confidentiality, it's really essential for the peer mentor to be able to be in communication with other members of a patient support team. And um, so being able to um, build trust between the patient and those other members of their care team, like, can we role play this discussion you wanna have with your therapist? Can we sit down together and write out the questions that you'd like to ask your medical provider? Um, these are all things that can also be bi-directional. Um, so the, the peer mentor themselves can provide feedback to other members of the care team on how to engage the patient further and maybe highlight needs that the patient could be having difficulty communicating on their own. This ties right into connection. Um, rapport building is such a big part of this work. Um, so often I'll hear from folks that they just wanna be seen as something other than their diagnosis. Time and time again, you're spending hours in sessions, in treatment meetings, um, where mostly you're talking about your symptoms and things that are really uh, one part of who you are. And so peer mentorship can be a space to talk about your hobbies, your interests, things that really excite you. Uh, and eventually those conversations can be turned to, well, how is the eating disorder getting in the way of you fully connecting with those things that make you who you are? Um, and that can be a huge motivator for folks as they start to move through different chapters of their recovery. And then hopefulness. Um, as I mentioned, this could be using self-disclosure. It could also be role modeling, realistic examples of what recovery looks like. I wanted to highlight this with an anecdote from my own recovery. Um, this wasn't a formal mentoring relationship, um, but I remember one of the first few folks I met who was very open about their recovery experience invited me to breakfast. And I always remember she was eating this breakfast sandwich that was beautiful, had bread and bacon and eggs and cheese. Um, at the time, many foods that were very scary to my eating disorder. 
And I remember at one point she paused and said, you know, there was a point where I don't think I would have been able to do this, to be able to both fully enjoy this amazing breakfast sandwich, and then also feel fully present with you in this conversation. And I remember having a really mixed bag of feelings around that. On one hand, there was some hope there. Like, oh, that's really possible. <laughs> you can really get to that point. There was also some fearfulness of, oh, I have some more work to do, which can be a scary feeling. But at the end of the day, that was to me an example of, oh, this is a realistic example of what recovery can look like. And that gives me a little bit more motivation that all this hard work is worth it in the end. And with that, I'll pass it to you, JD. Thank you, Maris. Um, so our situation was that my daughter was 17, again, youngest of four. I think Kevin mentioned that. Um, and she and her friends were done with their high school sport. They were thinking about college and they decided we're going to do a, a healthy eating makeover. Uh, I think it's really helpful to note that my daughter didn't have significant body image issues or self-esteem issues going into this. A lot of this came from the anorexia and resolved with the resolution of the anorexia. So it began very simply. She wasn't trying to do a crash diet or anything, but deteriorated very rapidly um, and you know needed um, emergency care. I've come to be really grateful because a lot of people can have a little bit more of a slow burn. And so in some ways, the drasticness was a gift that couldn't be ignored. Um, one of the reasons we were seeing a pediatrician and her GI and doing the you know scoping route um, to figure out the cause of why she wasn't able to eat um, and was losing all this weight was because she had uh, an osognosia very, very seriously. She literally had no idea what was going on with her. She was accurately reporting her medical systems. She was sort of as confused as the rest of us were. And again, um, you heard from Kevin that we had access to really good care right away. And that care came in a multifamily format. And the clinical care we had was absolutely incredible. And the clinical care also recognized that other families were important in this process as well. And part of it for me was having a, being in a group of people where they were months ahead of where I was, gave me a roadmap, a visualization of what was possible. Um, so to really echo Maris's point, really all I had heard up until then was this is something you will deal with for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I was able to see people happy and laughing with their child when my own child was uh, a shell, really a hollow shell is the way she describes it. So that hope piece of things really, I don't think can be underrated. So with a family mentor, a big part of it is just being warm, just being validating and welcoming and lending that listening ear to families who are discovering all of the things that you discovered when you entered into this and letting them process it with a, you know, with just a kind ear to listen to. Um, practical support is huge. Um, we talk a lot about bridging theory and practice. And I found that to be super present for me in the realm of feeding my daughter, um, of all of that we needed to do, of all of the reactions to it, all of those sorts of things. Um, the practical support of people saying, well, I tried this, you know, maybe it'll work for you. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but all of that was really helpful. Um, and that group support piece of things, which we do a lot of at Equip, is bringing families together in that multifamily format, which really normalizes what is, frankly, bizarre behavior, challenges, all of those sorts of things. Um, and all of it, again, being grounded in communication, um, connecting not only with the family, but with other providers. Um, very often, we see that families will disclose to their family mentor something that they're a little bit embarrassed to disclose to their therapist. And so the family mentor can talk them through that disclosure, support them through that disclosure, let them know the reason why it's so important. And sometimes, you know, a family mentor will say, do you want me to join the therapy session with you just so I can support you as you have that conversation or with the dietitian? And those are really, really helpful uh, pieces of the family mentor care. All right, I'll come back in now. Um, so my experience, a little different. Um, I've been in the mental health field for over six years. I've worked in a variety of settings with a variety of diagnoses. Um, I've been here at Equip in the eating disorder field for about three years now. This is the first setting I've worked in that utilizes mentorship in this really strategic, skillful um, way. 
Um, and I am someone who does not have direct lived experience for myself or as a care of a loved one who's had an eating disorder. So being able to be at a place where, um, we can utilize lived experience and mentorship, um, but to me, it makes a huge difference. Um, I can't tell you the number of times as I'm sure maybe some of you have experienced as well, where your patient just really, you're not their favorite person and they don't want to talk to you. And you know what, sometimes they might be really expressive about that. And, and, and we know, we know that we'll see that resistance and we'll, that lack of insight. And, and so when, when that happens and we see that it, it's, it's so wonderful to be able to have a peer mentor, um, to, to, to direct that patient to, to say, you know, it's a, it's a different space. It's a, it, it's someone you can relate and hopefully just feel a bit more validated and holistically seen like Maris was saying, and then similar for, for families and for parents who are just overwhelmed with their emotions and, and the experience they have with providers, it, it's overwhelming. And so to be able to have a space like family mentorship, um, is just, it's, it's as a clinician, my experience, I'm very grateful for it. Um, but in regards to the role of the therapist on the team, specifically at Equip, I'll go into it a little bit. Um, obviously, we're in the, the business of, of finding healing for people and, and their mental health. So ongoing therapeutic assessment, um, processing, um, whether that's family-based or in CBTE, individual-based. Um, we're seeking to increase insight, motivation in order to overcome behavioral and cognitive barriers to recovery, while also remaining mindful of any comorbidities um, that could be barriers to care and in engaging in any, any necessary interventions. Um, at Equip, we really seek to empower patients and families to understand their own or their loved one's needs, build confidence um, in their in their self to, to overcome those fears, set boundaries, um, get their needs met in a, in a healthy way in order to find lasting recovery. Um, expertise, I mean, we, um, sometimes pro pro and con, right? We we had the expertise through experience, through education to provide the guidance and inform treatment expectations. I say sometimes it's a con because as I'll go into a little bit later, there can be that like white coat syndrome that really just defines the experience for families. Um, and then accountability as a, as a touch point, weekly sessions allow for follow-up discussion about goals, obstacles, um, and, and just helps us keep the focus on treatment goals. All right. I'm going to keep talking uh, the, the specific benefit, like I went into a little bit earlier that mentorship provides to clinicians. So we got to talk, talk about this topic of self-disclosure highly debated, um, hot topic still. Um, so long held belief backed by research that self-disclosure in the context of a clinical relationship, which is for the sake I'll define it, it's a, any behavior or verbalization that reveals personal information about the patient, sorry, to the patient about the clinician, it should be minimized, monitored, like just very closely monitored and just avoided at all as much as possible. Um, most of the research was wanting, sending this message, this warning that self-disclosure comes with the risk of the ter that the territory of inquiry will be shifted from the patient to the physician. So keeping things patient-centered, keeping things, um, you know, it's, 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 as, it's as if you're not in the room, right? And the patient is, is there doing a lot of this work on their own. And there's benefits to that. Um, but it has come to light in the last decade, especially that self-disclosure to a certain extent and limited to certain topics, right? Like we were saying very strategically can provide positive effects and improving patient and provider rapport. Um, it creates a more warmer, more um, authentic atmosphere um, that can help um, build a relation, some relational attachments. So um there's caution still that it's not excessive. We still don't want to initiate a sense of role reversal um, in any way. Um, and so, but but there's lots of benefits. So whether a provider chooses to engage in a level of self-disclosure or not, at Equip, we have many providers who have their own lived experience. And some may choose to share that and some may choose not to share that strategically. And again, in my for myself, someone who doesn't have the lived experience in order to in order having a team with others who can even more so provide that space um, is really 
really beneficial, which is the next slide. I'll go into more. Um, so filling the gap, um, the gap that exists because um, we we are trying to remain um, clinical and, and really monitor that level of self-disclosure. So filling the gap with patients and families, what mentorship does to fill the gap. It offers a space for support um, for patients to receive guidance so that clinical sessions can remain focused on eating disorder symptoms and behaviors. Um, I'll, I'll say in a way, um, lots of requests I get when we do family-based treatment, fam um, patients wanting individual therapy or, or, or their parents, loved ones wanting it for their kids, but not appropriate for us to do as a family-based setting because we're focused on other things. So mentorship brings in this level of, of being able to work on individual skill building um, and, and another place for them to practice those skills. Um, the mentorship relationship provides a space for those receiving care to feel more holistically seen and heard. Already mentioned um, there, the mentorship can feel like a space with less expectation and judgment. Um, the patient determines what their need is in the moment. A lot of times a clinical session, um, whether it's with a dietitian, a medical provider or a therapist, it come, you come in and, and we know what we need to talk about. We need to talk about our objectives and our goals and our barriers and our obstacles and the meal plan and the, you know, heart rate, right? All those things are really important, but there's so much more, right, to a patient, like, like you said earlier, Maris. And so mentorship provides that space for them to talk about uh, you know, uh, how stressed I was today when I took a test or, you know, a parent and, and maybe the, um, you know, financial strain that they're experiencing. Those things really matter too. Mentors are true experts in the day-to-day -day life of, of eating disorder, of, of care, of treatment. Um, I already mentioned mentorship can help build the individual skill building piece. And then mentorship offers a reprieve from the more clinical appointments. Some of these sessions can look like some of the mentors, mentorship sessions can look like drawing together, discussing favorite hobbies, or look, what whatever you can imagine, because it didn't get filled in there. But it is, it can definitely feel more flexible. And I know um, situations where they like listen to their favorite song with their peer mentor. Um, family mentors have shared about the vacation that they just went on. So, so just more of a relaxed environment. Um, and then we want to think about how we fill the gap with other providers, how mentors help us see, again, just this more holistic picture. Um, so it helps us allow for a more thorough understanding of what can happen in the home. Maybe there's behaviors that are that are outside of uh, outside of their value, the, the, the patient's values. And um, they, you know, again, might not always come into a session being able to or, or really feeling comfortable enough to talk about more sensitive some sensitive topics. Um, so mentorship can really provide that space for them and then be that message and communicate that with the rest of the team. Um, it can help provide greater context and empathy for these stressors and struggles um, around refeeding, behavior interruptions, sibling impacts, schooling decisions. There's so many facets to treatment and so many hardships that families experience. And so um, family mentors can get a bigger picture of that as well. Um, it gives us some insight into logistical challenges related to food prep, food and financial insecurity, um, and then understanding how families define recovery, which can differ from clinical definitions of recovery. And then we see that teens are more engaged and motivated in other sessions because they're meeting with their mentor. They're feeling more seen and more heard and more understood. Um, all right, last slide, I just wanna mention what I see as one half of this circle is the clinical relationship and that other half is the mentor relationship, which really creates this full experience where that, that gap is filled. So um, comparatively, you can see the clinical relationship, we can stay focused on the eating disorder because the mentor relationship can, can really offer support on a variety of subjects. Clinical relationship, goal-centered in eating disorder treatment most often, mentor relationship, it's patient-centered. They come with the topic of interest and really guide the session. Clinically relationship, it may or may not include self-disclosure in the best interest. Mentor relationship, it does include self-disclosure. Um, clinically, we're going to advocate for treatment expectations and treatment goals. 
Whereas in the mental relationship, they're advocating for the, the patient experience for, you know, I, we like to say at Equip, um, mentors really hold up the other end of the pole. You know, uh, family mentors just meet with the, the parents or, or their, their caregivers. Peer mentors just meet with the patient. And so other, other, um, other clinicians don't see that, that pole as well because we're meeting with multiple members of the family. The clinical relationship viewed as the expert, right, which can come with pros and cons, mental relationship, they're viewed as a peer. Um, so maybe a little bit more relatable um, and, and, and more able to be vulnerable with that person. Um, the clinical relationship is an environment to, an environment to process um, the treatment trajectory. And then the mental relationship is an environment to process built on mutual understanding. Um, clinical relationship, we embody education, again, that expertise and that clinical guidance, and the mental relationship embodies hope. Thank you so much, Lainey. We wanted to put uh, just a brief summary slide here with some additional resources as well. Um, before moving into, we do have a brief uh, case study we'd like to present. Uh, but to really tie back to our uh, objectives that we set out at the beginning of the presentation, there is a current body of research detailing the power of peer mentorship and family peer to peer mentorship. Um, and we know that more research is needed and we're really excited about this expanding field of research. There are a wide variety of benefits to the use of lived experience mentors that are specific to eating disorder recovery, which is a very unique diagnosis and experience. And then over on the right, and we will share these slides after the presentation, we highly recommend checking out these resources um, as JD mentioned, so many of them are um, really leaders and innovators in the field of peer support, and we encourage you to check them out and support their work. And with that, I'll turn it to you, JD, to uh, present our case study. Yeah, I was lucky enough to uh, work with this family, be part of the team that worked with this family, and it was really, really rewarding. Um, this is a young woman with restricting anorexia who lived with her parents and siblings in the Midwest. And she'd been diagnosed as a freshman in high school and received residential partial hospitalization care. And in five years, she had not restored even to the weight that she was at 14. She continued to struggle. She, the family was very close and tight. And um, the family was really sort of keeping her afloat, but not moving forward toward recovery. Then the pandemic came along and everyone came home. And at that same time, um, mom was getting online and seeing and learning about some things. And one of the things she learned about was equip. And so what was really important was that everyone in the family could participate in these sessions. Um, if one person was at work and one person was at home and though they could still all join the session. So that was really helpful um, to have parents remain on the same page. A um, lot of training and support from everyone. And then that peer mentor really showing the hope for all of this was really, really important to the patient herself, to Ella. Um, so after years of no gain, this family really got down to work and they achieved that target weight in just a few months. Um, and were able to collaborate on the team to map out a path to full recovery. What was it gonna look like when she returned to school? What was it going to look like when she hopefully studied abroad? All of those sorts of things. So a real success story um, and a really, really amazing case to work with to see the, the progress after that long of a time of just sort of treading water. And some of the comments about mentorship that we've received, we're lucky that our families and our patients give us a lot of uh, wonderful feedback that we get to collect. Um, and so one of the comments was peer mentorship proved to be invaluable to our family. Lisa, our wonderful family mentor, validated me and understood when no one else around me truly did. She also helped align our direction with FBT as a couple, unifying us in the fight to get our daughter well. And you've seen this in practice with families, I'm sure, and certainly those of us who've had a child with an eating disorder have really lived how difficult it is to align around this and how important it is. Um, and then also um, always kudos to our peer mentors. Uh, my daughter's peer mentor was able to draw my daughter out. She helped her to see from a shared perspective that the hard things can be done. And my words to my daughter had value and the same words from the mentor landed differently. And even outside of eating disorder recovery, right? If you've parented a teenager, you can really see why that is um, so impactful. 
people. So really um, I'm lucky to have family mentors, peer mentors, and have a clinical team and a provider team that works together so effectively, that values each other, and that it has time and space to communicate with each other for the benefit of our patients. So we have some references that we're going to share with you, as Mara said on the slides, and we want to make sure we get to the to the questions. So I'm going to pitch those up for the group. So uh, Lainey and uh, Maris, get ready. Um, so from Jenny, who I actually happen to know is an amazing person in her own right in this field, um, there's a statement that family mentors have experienced leading a loved one through recovery. Can you clarify, can a family mentor be effective if their loved one did not actually achieve recovery? Jenny, thank you for that. I think it's a really important distinction. And yes, it, it is true that somebody can, and we do have people in that position. And I think one of the important things to really recognize is that there's many people who did everything, you know, sort of right if we're using binary terms. And for a variety of reasons, very often timing of when their story started, weren't able to have their own loved one achieve recovery and have a lot of wisdom that they can pass on to other people. Um, and some of our most amazing family mentors are themselves people, people who were in that sort of like struggled for five years and didn't make progress space, got the right information, got it done, and they are really effective in spurring others to action. Um, Question from Noelle, given the evidence that peer support is so effective, do you think this will translate to insurance companies cover eating and sort of recovery coaching services? Uh, do either one of you have a like, sort of specific thoughts around that? Or I, th I think the overall answer is we hope so. Like we really would like that. Um, a lot of you are clinicians in private practice who aren't working within the equipped framework. Um, and there are some, are some amazing uh, peer mentor certification programs and things like that. Um, and I think folks are probably really trying to work on that angle. And if I had to go somewhere for information about where that is, I probably would go to Carolyn Costin and see, I'm assuming that's something she's working on really robustly. Maris, this is for you. Uh, how can being a mentor affect the mentor's own recovery journey? Yeah, really good question. And something I thought about myself as I started to work more in this field. And I, um, I think everything I'm going to say is probably a really long-winded way to say it depends on the individual, um, which from my own experience, I found it to be actually incredibly helpful for my long-term recovery in that it feels like a great source of accountability. I mean, if I'm going to be working with patients day in and day out, talking about you know, doing the work, I, I want to be doing the work on my own end as well. At the same time, everyone is different. I've met folks who have decided that this wouldn't be work that is beneficial to their own recovery. Um, and that's for, that's a very personal decision that I've seen folks take very seriously working with their therapist or um, loved ones or people they care about that have been very involved in their own recoveries. So I think it depends on the individual. And in um, many situations, it can be actually, uh, I think, beneficial to folks' long-term recovery. Yeah, and um, really good follow-up question on that is as an organization, how do we respond to a peer mentor who may or may have had a relapse in their own eating disorder symptoms? And I think Maris, that's a, that's a question you're very well suited to answer. We're talking about your team. Yeah, you know, I think a, a core belief that we have at Equip is that um, we want our clinicians to, um, you know, be well and supported and happy. Um, and that will make them, uh, you know, effective in the work they do. So our primary concern will always be how is an individual doing? Are there resources that are needed that we can help them get in touch with? Um, of course, as a larger organization, we luckily have the benefit of, um, you know, we we have um, members on our people team that can be very supportive to folks looking for additional support. So our primary concern will always be, how are you doing as a provider? How can we support you? And I will, I will also say that Something that I have just seen as a common thread amongst folks with lived experience is that they're very self-reflective and thoughtful people. Um, and they're very proactive in thinking about what do I need to do to fill my own cup in order to continue doing this work in a sustainable way? Um, so I think folks in the field tend to be quite proactive in thinking through that discussion. Yeah, I really, really agree with that. Um, and I'm gonna kind of further put in a plug for, I think Gen Z is spectacular at this overall. And I learn a lot, a lot, a lot from our peer mentors that I really appreciate. Um, another one from Jenny, who's ever insightful. Um, Few places have the ability to have the peer mentor integrated as part of the treatment team like Equip does. Any recommendations or red flags for places wanting to build peer and or family mentorship that is not part of an integrated system. Lainey, this is a really great question. What are your thoughts around that? 
Mm -hmm. That is a good question, Jenny. Thank you for asking. And I think what I would definitely say and and work that we do similarly with other clinicians outside of um, our organization or or if we work independently um, is is communicating. Um, I think, again, benefit we have is, is our our mentors we know are trained on on what their role is versus a clinical role and, and being sure not to provide anything outside of their scope, whether that's medical advice or, or therapeutic advice or diagnoses. And so um, I would want to know who that mentor is, what their background is, and and yeah, what what they're working with um, my patient on. Um, what else? Um, I had another thought. But... I... I'm thinking also, Lainey, one of the things, because she said any red flags for places not wanting to build peer and her family support that's not integrated, um, I think it really is going to be logistically depending on the setting, right? Are you a private practice person? That sort of thing. And I I, I see in Jenny's question also sort of like bigger systems that are um, realizing the power of peer support. And I'm going to say that as someone who's had the, the privilege of professionalizing something that was done without pay as a volunteer for a long, long, long time. I think that I would really want to ask some questions about sort of where are we in respect for what this is, for remuneration for what this is. So really, um, if we're going to say that everyone has this really powerful role and is part of things, like what are the logistical hurdles to integration? And that might give you some answers and thoughts about that. Any other thoughts, Lainey, on that? I know you lost one and sometimes they come back to us. We all go through that. Um, and um, for Renee, there was a question, I think probably about uh, the case study. Do you think the pandemic influenced some of the success, meaning people had stopped and really focused on what is important in their lives? Um, I will say from my perspective, lots of families did say that. Lots of families said, we didn't really know because we weren't together that much, or we noticed it because we were together that much, or we had time to have it together that much. I'm also going to caveat this with we were doing FBT during the pandemic. And one of the things we discovered is uh, the pandemic lockdown was awesome for phase one. It was not helpful for phase two at all. So I think it's like anything else. There's, you know, sort of um, positives and, and drawbacks to it. Um, for you, Lainey, how did you experience that? Definitely. Certainly, I think that the bulk, I, I'm, I'm not going to really know the percentage, but uh, gosh, more than half of the patients I've seen in the last few years, really symptomology either started due to the isolation they experienced in the pandemic, or like you said, JD has had been there, but just became so much more worse um, during the pandemic. And so um, I think the, the ability for families to really um, see their kid without distractions, um, without their sport, without their friends around, right? Like that, that was really hard for them to experience. And when, when we lose all that we have, we really learn what we need. Um, and, and so, um, the power of families to, to find something, to seek out help, to do these really hard things, I think was enhanced, able to be enhanced, um, through the pandemic, just when they had access to care, if they had access to care or as they came out of it, because yeah, they, you know, it took us a while to reintegrate back into things as society and still are right. Um, whether that's just, um, going places outside of the home or, you know, um, parties and dinners. And, uh, and so when we have less things on our schedule, we can focus on our health. We can be more aware, uh, we can support each other in the home. And I personally hope that's something that continues to uh, positively impact our society um, that we learned through the pandemic. Um, well, I want to remind everyone to look in the webinar chat for all the CE things. And Amaris, I just wanted to give you a chance. Any last thoughts on that topic or any other topic? No, I, I think you both summed it up well. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, for the insightful questions and for listening to us.